Hi and welcome to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast for athletes, coaches and professionals who want to achieve their goals faster. I'm David Charlton and I'll be sharing proven methods from leading athletes, coaches and experts that will help you get the most from your talent. Today's show is sponsored by Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosforth, near Newcastle upon Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. So today I'm joined by Peter Ramage, a former footballer who played for Newcastle United, QPR, and Crystal Palace, as well as many other teams. Played over 100 games in the Premier League as a defender, I think. Fifty. Um, I managed to get fifty odd games. I wish I'd got to a hundred. Oh, ACL, ACL industries, and we'll talk about that later. ACLs carry curtail that. Right. I'm sure we'll go on to talk about that a little bit later. Now, Peter is assistant coach for Phoenix Phoenix Rising FC in the US Soccer League. So, so yeah, welcome, Peter. And yeah, no, thanks, fun. David. Thanks, thanks for having us on. So, the plan is going to be to discuss different parts of your career as a player. And now as a coach, and hopefully we can leave the listeners with some good stories and tips, little bits of advice on, on handling adversity and setbacks. Hopefully. With a bit of luck. <laughs> <laughs> so firstly, you began your career with Newcastle United as an academy player. You went on to progress to the first team. Are you able just to share your experiences about yeah. like, coming through the ranks and again some of the obstacles that you, you came across along the way? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I came in as a as an eleven year old, uh, hopeful. Um, you know, came through the ranks, went through through all the ages, through the the academy, the seventeens and nineteens, as it was back then. Progressed into the reserves and um, into the first team. Um, but when you know the the thing that sticks in my mind from from my time at the academy was probably the first the day be well, it was the night before the first day of, of pre season. Um, we had a meeting with Al Nervine, parents, players. Uh, he was kind of just giving us a little insight of what we're about to uh, to go through or the process we're about to go to. And he was he was pretty open and honest. And excuse me, he said that the 13 players were there. You know, Belly was there. Reddy was one of them. Um, and he said of the 13 players that are sitting in front of him, he said it'll potentially only one of you will, will go through this process and end up playing in the first team. And, you know, I was looking at players that were sitting around me. I had you know, Carl, Carl Bell, you know, goalkeeper played for England, Michael Chopra played for England, Tommy English, Damon Robson, players at Richard Offingham, Chrissy Moore, guys who were, um, who'd been in at national setups um, and were probably earmarked as, uh, as talent and future talent. And, you know, I never for one minute thought that I would potentially be that one of them or that one of 13 that would come through and it was a bit of a reality check because everybody in that room probably thought it was going to be them. But uh, working through, uh, you had to to work your socks off just to be able to have an opportunity. And um, you know, whilst talent was limited, um, even throughout my career, my, my hard work and determination to kind of prove people wrong was was there from the outset. And I wanted to, you know, be that one out of thirteen that you know Alan said. And you know, fortunate enough, um, there was myself came through. Uh, Michael obviously came through, and we were the kind of two that progressed through that age group and and made it and and kind of had a sustained career. So, you know, when Alan, when I look back and and I and I remember, and my mum and dad remind me of it as well. When he said that at a kind of sixteen, seventeen year old, it it, um, it really hit home. It's it, it, what I achieved. So when you look back at those kids nowadays at 16, 17 year old, uh, I'm, I'm assuming you know similar messages are going to be sent to them in, in all the different academies. Do you think like they're well prepared like mentally to deal with that? That's a good question. Um, no, um, if I'm brutally honest with you, I think some. Uh, I'm looking at the. I think like my era. I think yes, they were because the environment that you grew up in was a lot harsher than it is now. You know, Alan was a, a big component of trying to um, to quote the All Blacks phrase, you know, better people make better All Blacks. And that was Alan's kind of mantra even back then, was that he wanted to prepare you for the, the hardships of, of life in general, not just life as a footballer. You know, he wanted to make you succeed because, you know, whilst not everybody's going to come through and make it as a footballer, he, he wanted to make sure that people were successful in, you know, whatever they w- went on to do. Um, you know, a couple of the players just didn't, after a few weeks, few months, just football wasn't for them. Um, but he tried to prepare you um, to to be successful. 
and I'm not sure that that's the same as nowadays. Um, you know, everything's kind of handed to kids on a silver platter. Yeah, you know, we had to pick up dirty kit, we had to clean boots, we had to, you know, move goals, get balls, bibs and cones ready and things like that. Whereas I think nowadays kids are kind of, t- them kind of responsibilities are taken away from them. So whilst it's good because they can only focus on football and should be able to only focus on football, I do think that, you know, having the responsibility of, a, of an outside job to make sure, you know, all them tangibles are, are in line. Um, it gives you a little bit of a reality check as to, to what really needed to become a become a top class professional, and and that was you know when I look back at the era that, that you know we had then, there was a hell of a lot of players came through and had a had a sustained career because of of the kind of them fundamentals that we were we were taught from a from a very young age. Just by doing those little tasks that you've talked about, it's teaching kids about like organising themselves, taking responsibility, discipline, Correct. those little factors. Yeah, I mean, that was a big thing for us was, you know, you were accountable for your own little job. Now, some of the jobs, I mean, we were, we used to get the bus from St. James. It used to take us down to Durham Maiden Castle. Um, we had to be on time. Um, the bus always left at 8.45, no later, not a second later. If you'd missed the bus, you had to get the train or taxi, you know, so you had the responsibility of not being late. You know, there was hardly ever a time where I think anybody was late. Um, it may be in like an extreme circumstance, but as soon as you walked in the in the door at, at nine fifteen, you know you had a you had a job and you had a responsibility to do. Now sometimes that job was done by nine thirty in the morning, but one of your teammates might have had a job that you know was to to collect everything up and make sure the dressing room was swept and and tidy. And you know what it taught us as well was a bit of kind of, um, camaraderie to to kind of help each other out. You know I see that I used to we used to help each other because if. The longer it took the last person to do the job, the longer it took to get home. And, you know, these are bloody long days that you used to, used to have. I mean, me and Belly used to, to get back and then get the metro to, to West Monk Seaton and Monk Seaton and get in the house at half seven at night. And then we'd be up at half six to get the seven o'clock metro to be able to make sure we were getting in in the morning. So you'd, you're doing 12-hour shifts. Well, if you didn't help your mate out who's got the last job, then sometimes you weren't getting home till late. And, you know, you basically your days are all rolling into one. So responsibility towards your teammates as well and, and accountability for them to, to help them out. And like I said, I'm not sure um, them kind of uh, responsibilities are, are laid to, to young players nowadays that, you know, gives them that, um, gives them that head start in, in any walk of life. Yeah, because ultimately that's going to build that, like you say, the teamwork, that sort of team first mentality, if you like, going, yeah. going forward, interesting stuff. So, so as you... As you progressed through the academy and like going on to, to make your debut, what sort of setbacks, challenges did you did you have to overcome during that period? For me, the the challenge I faced was actually trying to play com- real competitive football in terms of trying to go on loan. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time in the reserves. Um, had the opportunity on on a number of occasions to to go out on loan, but just was never never allowed to. To be honest with you, I mean, I didn't make my debut till I was twenty one. You know, I had seen guys where we're going out on loan at 17, 18, 19 year old, 20 year old playing games. Um, and I was kind of never, never privy to it. So I was getting a little bit frustrated that I kept playing reserve team football um, when not getting out and, and testing myself. Um, you know, I was playing, I mean, the reserve team football back then was a hell of a lot more competitive than what it is now. Um, you know, we had many stars playing in the, in the, in the teams. And sometimes for me, it was, I had to, uh, I had to wait a week because, you know, Titus Bramble or um, back in the day Marcelino or somebody like that was was getting a game ahead of me. So I just wanted to get on loan. So trying to to train Monday to Friday or as it was then for the reserves, it was kind of Sunday to Sunday to Sunday with the games on a Monday. Was trying to keep myself focused and ready for for them games with without without the opportunity of games. To be honest with you, so it was tough. But you know, I was training week in week out and day in day out with the first team at that time, and that was. Um, that was an education in itself and, and learning to deal with um, Craig Bellamy, calling you all sorts of names under the sun, Kieran Dyer, you know, Alan Shearer, um, top class stars, you know, these kind of players, uh, training with them and as a young kid making mistakes and learning from them and, and learning from these guys was, uh, was obviously a challenge as well. And you're going to have to raise the bar in terms of your performances unless you're going to be embarrassed. Correct. And that was, I mean... 
there's a lot being said over the years about obviously Bellas and Kieran and things like that. But the one thing that they wanted from us young kids was to know that they could trust us when we went on the field. Because obviously at the end of the day, these were top class international stars who wanted to win every week. And if they had a kid who couldn't rise to the occasion, like you just said there, then it was going to affect them potentially. It was going to affect them maybe getting in their, their international or their respective international squad. So, you know, it's, it's, if you can deal with Craig Bellamy and Kieran Dyer shouting at you day in, day out, then you can, you can deal with 52,000 shouting at you, you know, and that was the kind of the mental test for, for me in particular. And, you know, I always remember Steve Harper and Shea pulling me to a side and, you know, I shrunk at the, at the beginning of it, but then, they, you know, they told me to basically, excuse the French, but grow a set of bollocks and, uh, and rise to that kind of torment from these players because at the end of the day, they, weren't, they were doing it for, for many reasons, but they were doing it just to see if you could cope with the pressure. And if you cope with the pressure, then you earned their respect. Um, and that's, thankfully for me, you know, I, I earned Kieran's respect, earned Craig's uh, respect. So when, we, when I trained and when I played, that, you know, they understood and, and knew that I could do the job for them. Yeah, it makes sense that does because let's face it, you do see a lot of like, young players coming in, and yeah, they, well, they maybe have what ten minutes, half an hour, and then and then that's it. They never get another look in, don't they? Yeah, and I mean, like I said, talent was never, you know, never. I had I had talent, I had ability, but my hard work and determination got me through there. But also a kind of single mindedness, you know. As many times I, you know, I just answered back. Um, I started to stand on my own two feet and. Uh, and not take the the crap that they were giving me, um, and I think once they once you get that barrier, then you can start to think, yeah, I do deserve to be here. I do deserve to be in the same team as you guys, and I, you know I can handle that pressure. Uh, and when you know abuse is thrown at you from the stands, at, at away grounds, at home grounds, wherever it may be, you can you can deal with it. You can rise above it, and you know power your way through, and and still try to to perform at a high level. That's going to try and win your games. And when you think about mental toughness, that gets down to confidence, really trusting your ability, focusing on what you can control, and then asserting yourself in different situations with different people, not worrying about who it is, how big a star they are. Yeah, I mean, some of the times you, you kind of, I mean, especially with Craig, he just argued because he liked to argue. Um, <laughs> but he was brilliant, you know, because if you answered back with, you answered back with a with kind of a, a reasonable argument, he would, yeah, he would probably snap your head off, but then he would come, and Kieran was the same. I, and I'm just using these two examples because, it, you know, they're well-renowned for, for what they were like. But, you know, the pair of them were, um, were humble enough to come to you, you know, maybe five, ten minutes, 20 minutes later, whatever, and be, yeah, Rami, you know what it is, you were right. Uh, sorry for, for having to blow at you on the pitch, but, yeah, on, on, you know, once, they, once the dust is out, yeah, you were right. And that was great for me because that's when I started to think, yeah, I've got the confidence of these guys. So when you go out on the pitch and you do make a mistake, they're one of their... They're, Kieran in particular was one of the first people to come and say, come on, come on, you can get yourself through this. Come on, give me the ball. Just give me the ball. When you get it, give me the ball. I'll get you through this. And that was great. And for a young kid coming through, um, it was brilliant that I had, you know, people like that. And, uh, you know, like uh, I reference them too, but like Alan Shearer, you know, Steve Harper, Shea Given, top class players around me, Nicky Butt, who were like, when, you know, when I was, was nervous going into games, First couple of passes, just give me the ball. Don't try anything to I'll, he said, I would say, if you knock it, just knock it anywhere around me. I'll, I'll win it for you. And that was brilliant because then your confidence starts to grow and you think, and the next pass might be, your first pass might be 10 yards away from them. Your next pass might be five yards away. And then all of a sudden, now you're starting to find them and then you're starting to hit them. So just having the confidence of your teammate from a, from a young age was, um, was a real boost for me um, and was a real help for, for going into you know, Premier League action. The, the fact that they were willing to put their hands up and, and say that they were wrong probably was a big factor in that. If they were to have a go and then you always felt that they were right all the time, then you might have looked at them a little bit differently. Yeah, I mean, like you, I, had, I, I learned, if I'm brutally honest with you, I learned to become kind of a, a confrontational person after you know, seeing and being privy to, to what I was, at that, especially them younger days at, at Newcastle with the players that I, I came through. You know, I think it's it was an aura and a, a communication was a big attribute of my game. And you know, but I was still, if I had a go at you, it was having a go at you for a reason. But then, if you answered back with a with a you know a, a compelling argument, I'll be the first. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, my bad. You know, I, and I and I was like, and I took that kind of attitude from from them guys throughout my career, and you know, it got me through. 
and that's it's it's now for me as a coach I'm the same thing I'm still a volatile character some of the guys will tell you but I'm I'm certainly the one of the first ones to put an arm around them uh, and encourage them and make sure that you know yeah well I'm having a go at you I'm having a go at you for a reason um, but I'm also open to 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 your views and and because at the end of the day we're all um, we're all teachers of the game while we're all you know kind of working within it. You mentioned about uh, being nervous before games. I've worked with players, different athletes who've who've been sick in the changing rooms, kind of get off the toilet, all those sort of things. Did you? I suppose firstly, what was your what were your debuts like? Did you have any? Of those um, sort of yeah, my, to be fair, my my actual debut against Olympiacos when I came on. Um, I mean, I'd been on the bench a number of times, probably about half a dozen to a dozen times, and never really had a sniff of getting on. Um, I thought the Olympiacos game was going to be a potential that I think there was me and um, one of the other young lads, I can't remember who it was. Um, I thought if we were 3-1 up from the first leg. Uh, the second leg, we, I think we went 2-0 up at half time. Um, and then third goal went in and we were 6-1 up in the tie. And I thought, you, never, you know what it is, I might get a sniff here. But never really thought about it. And Graham Souness, you know, turned around to, to Steve Harper and said to him, that, you know, do you want the last 20 minutes, 25 minutes? I was like, no, you're one of the kids that gave you, man. I don't want to play 20 minutes. And it always resonated with me that he, you know, sacrificed an appearance. And, you know, it was basically, I think me and one of the, I can't remember that's going to bug me now, who was one of the other kids who was on the bench. He was like, right, first one to get the kit off, you're on. Uh, and, I was, and I was always fully prepared. I was always ready to go. So it was literally, I don't even think he'd snap his fingers or I don't think he managed to turn around before I was standing on the touchline and ready to go. And, um, I didn't have any nerves then because we were six one up in the tie, and Olympiacos had basically given given up. So it was uh, it was basically it was great to go on. You know, like I said, the first couple of passes, I think it was uh, playing in front of I think it was James James Milner, and even at a young age, I mean James was younger than me, but just give me the ball, give me the ball, I, I'll give me the ball and get around me, and it was brilliant. And then I get to uh, my Premier League debut. It was the kind of in the days leading up to it. Um, we're playing Man United and we're suffering from a couple of injuries. Um, in fact, more than a couple. And I thought, and I was in, in the, like the team in practice games. I was out the team. I was in the team. I was out the team. So I thought I might have half a sniff here. And then it was the Friday before the game. Graham Souness pulled me and said, you're playing. He said, get your head around it. He said, you've got 24 hours to get your, get your head around it. Get all the nerves out. Do whatever you need to do. You're going to start. And he says, to be honest with you, we're expected to get beat 6-0. So if you have a shocker, and you know what? Well, it, it doesn't matter. So I was like, right. But then again, you know, they had a lot of senior players around me. Stephen Carr was was playing in the centre of midfield, and obviously a, 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 an established international and a top class professional. And he was he was brilliant in the in the 24 hours leading up to it. Shea was the same, brilliant leading in the 24 hours up to it, and just encouraged me to go out and just enjoy the occasion because again, you're playing at Man United at Old Trafford, and we're expected to get beat, certainly with the injuries and. You know, we were lucky that day and I went out and that's the, the line-up when they, when they do the Premier League uh, the anthem or whatever it is and I'm, Giggs is walking past, Gary Neville's walking past, Alan Smith's walking past, Rooney's walking past and I'm like, holy shit, yeah, here we go. That's when I kind of thought, crap, nerves, is, nerves weren't really setting in before that and it was that and then I had no time in there. They gave the ball to me straight away. I made my first pass, and it was kind of it kind of went from there. And then you went to the game. I mean, you're into the game, and you, you I mean you're coming up against players that you know I'd watched win and lift Champions League. You know, I was marking Ryan Giggs. Um, I'm like, this guy's won tens of Premier League titles, FA Cups, Champions League trophies, and things like that. So if I can mix it with him. Um, then I can mix it with them all. Uh, and it was great. I loved loved every minute of it. Um, and it really, you know, after the first five minutes, it, like you said, you just, you get into the zone uh, and it's just another game of football. And ultimately, it's going it's to it's end up boosting your confidence, isn't it? And you, like you say, you're going to know you can do it and yeah, you, you carry on, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. And and I performed quite well. Obviously, Rune, my head and Rooney smashes the volley in. You, but even then, after the game, you think, wow, um, and then we played Middlesbrough on the Wednesday night, um, you know, a local derby, tying tees, and uh, went into that game brimming with confidence. You know, I'm thinking, yeah, done well, done well against against Man United. Um, you know, as soon as I said, you're going to play, 
Um, so I've played, I got man of the match in the game against, uh, against Borough. And then the game after, I think it was, uh, we played Everton away. Um, I mean, yeah, it was Everton away. And he just phoned me afterwards and he said, right, he says, you know, take a break. He said, you can't play, you know, you can't play Sunday, Wednesday or Sunday, Tuesday, whatever it was, Saturday. He said, I'm just going to take you out. He said, you've enjoyed it. You've done really well. He says, but now just sit back on the bench and let these older pros get on with it. And I kind of was like, you know, when you get a taste, you think, come on, I just want to keep going. You know, I just got man of the match. Surely, you know, I'm going to start and keep playing. And frustration kicked in a little bit. But then I also realised that where I was, you know, I was, a, I was a young kid and these guys are, you know, like I said, established in the Nationals. But, you know, I managed to play. I got in, I got on at half time, done well again. Um, next game we played, I think it was Palace at home. I think it was, uh, if memory serves me right, we drew nil nil again. Came on at half time, and I played left back, and I'd never played left back before, so that was a mental challenge to try and play a different position in the Premier League. And again, came on. Lauren Robert was in front of me, and Laurent just said, "Give me the ball," and that was a great thing, you know. You just give me the ball and get around me. Or if I go around the outside, just support me from behind. And it was brilliant that I had these stars that recognised that, you know, I was a young kid who. You know, obviously, maybe been a little bit nervous, but tried to to help me through the process of, of becoming a, a Premier League player. So your job was to stop the attacking player. Yeah. I'm a defender and defend first, and I had guys in front of me who, you know, they they just wanted the ball. So that was basically it. Just give me the ball. Um, you know, I think I don't think my passes were uh, were anywhere over you know 10, 15 yards. They're always just defeat, and it was brilliant. It built like we're talking about built my confidence up in in games where. You know, we were tough. Um, but to just be able to have these guys in front of me gave me a, a big confidence boost. So nowadays, with squad rotation and earlier, like in your career, being in and out of the team, being dropped and stuff would be would be quite difficult. How did you handle that? Yeah, I, and this is one of my regrets, if I'm brutally honest with you, because um, I wish I'd been kind of a little bit more stubborn um, because there was a period where that first, the second season, I played a lot of games at, at right back um, under Graham Souness. Uh, the year that you know he got sacked and I and I done well, but the year after I, I transitioned into centre half with Stephen Taylor, and I thought me and Tails were doing really well. And then I was, you know, established players were coming back, and I kind of just accepted it. Do you know what I mean? I just thought, right, okay, this is my role. Um, I'm a squad player. You know, I'll just I'll just get on with it. I'll not, you know batter down doors and ask why I'm getting you know, rested here or dropped there or um, squad rotate. I, and I didn't really, and this is one of my biggest regrets about my time at Newcastle, I didn't really work hard enough to, to stay in the team, both on and off the field. I wish I'd done more. I wish I'd been more you know, kind of hard-nosed and um, a little bit more aggressive in um, how I was on the training pitch. Uh, how I was off the pitch, you know, working on my game in terms of my physicality. I was never, I was never built like um, a typical centre half. I was tall and skinny, you know. I didn't, I just, I just accepted the position that I was at the football club, and you know, I wish I'd been a little bit more like Tails. Um, in some respect, Tails had that characteristic within him that he was like, "No, nah, I'm going to show you guys that I should be number one," and and he became number one centre back and. And I didn't do that, and it was um, it was something that you know, looking back on my time, uh, and and even going into leaving QPR, I kind of I didn't really do that until the latter stages of my career, when when it was probably too late for me to to get back to the the levels that I was at earlier on. Was that I didn't I didn't stand up for myself a little bit more than I should have done. What you're talking about there is marginal gains, point one mentality, if you like, where you look at different aspects of you your overall game and how you can potentially yeah, improve your performances. Yeah, and I, and I think as well, from a, from a mental standpoint, I just accepted my position. Uh, I accepted where I was as a, as a squad player. I didn't really um, sit down and look at myself in the mirror and be like, no, you, you're not a squad player, you're a first-team player. You know, you, you, you've earned the right to be where you are. You've earned the right to be a, a starting, a starting, a starting centre-back or a starting right-back. You know, go and keep working. Go and show that you deserve to be. I kind of just, yeah, okay, Gaffer, no worries. Yeah, no worries. Okay, I'll be ready when you need us again. I'd be like, why? What do I need to work on to stay in the team? What do I need to do to, to, for you to make me the number one? What do I need to do? Um, 
You know, it's not a, a, a good tip that I got taught by a coach was I never, um, you know, when a player comes in and is battering down the doors asking, you know, why he isn't playing, you know, I, come, you know, I turn it on to him. Well, what do you think you need to do to get in the team? Now, what it, and I should have been like that. Again, hindsight, it's a wonderful thing when you're looking down the line. You know, what could I have, what should I have done? What could I have done to, to change that mentality to, to be, you know, like I said, a little bit more stubborn, I go out on the training field, show the, the manager, do extra work in the gym, uh, maybe do more film work. Um, I just kind of, like I said, accepted my role within the, the squad at, at Newcastle and I didn't, I didn't really mentally um, kind of hard myself up a little bit. Do you find when you look back, some of the different managers that you played under, some would be more like open to that approach of being questioned, others would, wouldn't at all? Yeah, hundred percent. Again, I, I think it's how you approach the managers, and again, it was something that I was taught too late in my career. Really, is that you don't just go in battering the doors down, and you go in with, you know, what do I need to do, Gaffer? You know, I, is, am I? Am I? Like, he might say, say, you just had a crap game, and you don't deserve to play. All right, fair enough. Then I'll go out and work on hard on the training pitch, or it might have been a tactical thing that he wants you to work on. It might have been a technical thing that he wants you to work on, but not. I didn't really batter doors down throughout my career. Like I said, it was only kind of towards the latter part is when I kind of started to go in and, and not question decisions. I kind of just uh, questioned what I needed to do to, to get in teams. And I think that there was a lot of managers that I played with that would have been open to that. You know, I'm a, I'm a bubbly character. I'm a bubbly person. Even when, you know, the chips are down, I always like to work out with a smile on my face and try and be a good teammate. Um, and I think re- managers throughout my time and respected that and I think because I had that kind of respect through uh, with all the managers I kind of work with I think they would have been open to me coming in and just sitting having a chat and a cup of coffee and and asking what I needed to do. Thinking about like criticism you mentioned before you talk about criticism from your from your teammates potentially even from from managers obviously today with social media and having criticism from your own fans how do you deal with that? Um, That was a tough one for me because I mean social media back in I mean, we're talking when I left Newcastle was 2000 and kind of eight. It was the beginning of social media. You know, the platform isn't what it is now. Um, it isn't the kind of intense uh, scrutiny amongst players and st- uh, and fans that you know you can just basically you can write what you want nowadays. I mean, you could still do so then, but it wasn't as, as harsh probably back then as it was now. So I came into the beginning of of that kind of uh, era. Um, I mean, fan. To be honest with you, when fans were, were giving me crap on the sidelines, it didn't really affect me because, like we talked about just before my debut, I kind of got in the zone with games, so it didn't really affect me. But then, when social media started to come in, and I was getting active on it, and you know, I was reading all the comments, you know, Ramage is crap, he's the worst player, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I was reading them more than the ones that you know, obviously the complimentary ones, and uh, it was tough. I mean, everybody. Football footballers are still human beings, and you know they still have feelings. They still get hurt by comments. They still, you know, shrink when they when they see things like that. I mean, it's uh, it's something that I I you know I learned to have to deal with. And um, some comments, yeah, that did really affect me, and it and it affected my confidence as well going to games. That oh, I don't want to make a mistake because you know. Joe Bloggs is gonna, you know, be writing crap to me on Twitter, or he's gonna be writing crap to me on on Facebook or whatever it is, or Instagram or, and all this. And I was like, you know, I kind of went to my shell a little bit. But then it was, I started talking to to psychologists um, after my my second ACL injury, uh, but you know, the mental barrier trying to get through, you know, another major injury or my second major injury and. You know, one of the things we talked about was was social media and, and, you know, starting to build a mental block. And, you know, now I read them and I still read comments, you know, I was this, I was that. And I'm just like, you know what it is, I don't really give a shit because at the end of the day, I, you know, as crap as I must have been to be a footballer for you to make a comment and how crap are you because you didn't even make it. So, you know, these are obviously football fans who had dreams of being a footballer. Well, yeah, I made it as a footballer. You didn't. So what does that say about yourself? Um, so I just kind of batter everything off now and, and I kind of try and use it as fuel to, to work harder at, at myself as a, as a coach and as a person to make sure that, you know, I kind of turn whatever percentage it is as negativity into, into more positivity. I like that. You mentioned about the ACL injury. Do you want to just talk to us about, the, about that, how it happened and then the, like the process overcoming it? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I got my first one in my last year at contract when I was at Newcastle and, and that was a tough period for me because um, I was starting to really get into the team. Sam Allardyce had just taken over at Newcastle and, um, you know, I was I was getting games and I was getting, you know, opportunities and then uh, that kind of, that injury happened and my season was done. Um, and I didn't really know the process that I was going to go through. I mean, ACL injuries weren't as, as common back then as they are now. Um, Michael Owen had literally just, I think, uh, the year before, had gone obviously through the same process. So everything getting in, uh, injured with England at the World Cup, and, and he was still at the football club, and he was he was brilliant with me because he kind of he kind of just gone through the process. His was more severe than what mine was, but he was a he was a great shoulder to of, uh, of advice to, to you know, and he was one of the first ones every morning coming in. How, how are you doing today? You all right? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm all right. Thanks, Mike. Said, hey, listen, get through your day. Get through your day and it'll be a, one day closer. And I had somebody of that ilk to kind of look up to as to think, well, yeah, I can get back from this injury because if he can get back from that and his was 10 times worse than mine, then there's a hell of a chance that I'm going to get back. So that was great for me. But then the second one um, I'd done at QPR was the year that we got promoted and that was more tougher to get through because... I seen the guys winning week in, week out. They're coming in and, uh, you know, they were celebrating wins, celebrating, you know, ended up celebrating winning the championship. And, I mean, it was it was actually, it was nine years ago on Thursday uh, to the day that they won the they won the league. And there was a picture with me with the trophy. And, and I just feel, you know, almost ashamed that, I, you know, I've got the trophy in my hands because I didn't, I contributed to four games out of, was it 46? Um, and all of it was, you know, missed through an injury, and so I had a real, I had a real mental struggle over that period. And again, it was, you know, trying to speak to people to to come through, to through that process. That again, I thought, you know, I've had one injury on one knee, and then I've done my other, I've done my other knee. Am I going to be the same person? Am I going to be the same player? Um, so it was a real struggle to kind of get through that process. We, we just had our, uh, just had my daughter as well, so I had family issues going on. I had a young family and everything was kind of building up and you know it, it took me a long time to get over that barrier and um to to, uh, to continue to try and play there was a lot of the dark days but you know, I managed to get through it with the, the help and advice again of my teammates and, and the staff but also you know people outside of football that I could you know really just speak to about it. In a way it was an emotional roller coaster at that point support having a support system around you sounds as always was key yeah, I mean, I've got a I've got a wonderful family around me, and I'm blessed to to have people who, you know, my dad's, um, you know, being a, an international rugby referee, he's been privy to a lot of things um, on the sporting environment, and he's, um, you know, he was whilst they were up in, in Newcastle and I was down in London, they were always, you know, I think I spoke to me about two three times a day, same with my mum, you know, obviously my wife was absolutely unbelievable throughout the process too, you know, having to deal with her. A young kid and a, and a and a guy on on crutches who couldn't move around. She was she was a godsend and, and has been throughout you know my our time together. She's been incredible support to me to allow me to do what I want to do because we've we've moved here there and everywhere We're over here in Phoenix Arizona and she's moved with me. So if I hadn't had that support from from people around me, then you know I wouldn't have been able to do the thing that I love and and get through the the you know the the tough times that I've had throughout my career. That's a good point, the importance of family support. And I'm sure your wife will appreciate that comment. So, like summarising from, from a chat here, what would you say are the big takeaways that maybe you know, a young player going through academy trying to get into professional football can, can take away from this? Um, for me, one of the... You've got to, you've got to learn to, to, look, to stand up for yourself in the correct manner. You know, you can't... Just don't be, just don't accept things, you know, unless it's the, uh, you know, be open and honest. Because coaches, I mean, it's it's a big thing for me. I've, obviously, I'm going through. Like, coaches are, you know, their doors are always open, you know, just to chat and then having the courage to go and chat. You know, often I think, you know, looking back on my time, I, like I said before, I just accepted things. I didn't really have the courage to go and talk to to manager. I didn't have the courage to go and talk to. Um, to coaches or, or anybody but having that courage because it, it, you know it, it, we're all you know, men at the end of the day who you know it, it's, it's this stigma that we have that you know we can't be open and honest well if you're not open and honest 
first with yourself, but then with other people, then, you know, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, so for me, the, it's not so much having three, it's just having one of if that, having that courage to just to talk, just to, to get things off your chest. Um, because there is, you know, some unbelievable people in academies who are there to support you. You know, it might, it might even be your teammates. Just go and talk to your teammates, go and talk to your mom, go and talk to your dad. You know, because if, as soon as you start talking, there will be people there to help you get through whatever you're facing, um, whether it be a professional problem or a personal problem, you know, they'll, they will help you. And, and that's a, and it's a big thing that I, I try to tell our guys out here in Phoenix is that, you know, we are always here. If it's 10 o'clock at night, you want a phone call because something's going on with you and your missus or there's something playing, just, just pick up the phone and talk. Um, and I think that's the, my biggest, you know, my biggest advice to, to people facing, facing adversity. I like it. So basically we've got the, the coaches doors always open, have the courage to talk and then yeah, talking is powerful. It's, it's really good ultimately and it can only help you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to do, but if you do it, then you'll get further than, than holding everything in. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, you'll, you'll feel better and coaches are going to know what's going on inside your head as well at the same time. So exactly they're going to be able to help you exactly and if they don't have the answers then they can you know they can put you in touch you know i've uh you know i've got a, a brilliant support network of of contacts you know people like yourself and uh and, and other people in not even not just in the in the football industry but outside of it where i'm like if i don't have the answers then i'll put you in touch with somebody who does um, and i think that's a great thing about having um you know this this contact base is that I don't know everything and I don't, you know, portray to know everything, but I'll know somebody that will be able to answer the question for you. Um, and it's given the guys this courage to, to go and talk to a stranger. And I think that was one of the biggest things for me was that, you know, I, I just went and talked to, to a psychologist who I didn't have a clue who he was. And it was great because he didn't know me. I didn't know him. And we could just have a sit in the chat. And, you know, we spent, I spent years talking to him. That's great, Peter. Thanks for taking the time out and sharing your experiences and different bits of advice for the listeners. Um, oh, thank you. So, yeah, again, thanks thanks for your time. So where can uh, people find you on, on social media? Yeah, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. Uh, you know, I just reach out. I think it's Peter Ramage 83. Um, wherever you are, wherever I am, I'm on there somewhere. I'm always trying to uh trying to stay in the shadows just looking i'm to be honest i use social media and particularly more now for even in this time I, i'm i was i went to the physio the other day and my fingers were starting to cramp up and everything i was like oh i'm getting arthritis in my fingers I, one of my um what is it one of the words i cracked my knuckles it's one of my mrs pet peeves it's one of my you know little things i'm so oh, i'm getting arthritis i'm not gonna be able to play golf and the physio was like, no, 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 you've been sitting on your phone, you've been doing, that's all you've been doing. And I looked at the screen time is horrendous, it's hours spent on it, but I'm always on there trying to pick up ideas and like I said, trying to pick up tips and, and advice from people throughout all, all kinds of walks of life. And um, So I'm always on there somewhere. Always trying to get better than that. Yeah, exactly. If you, don't, if you don't, you'll just stand still and you'll never go anywhere. I like it. It's a nice way to finish. I'm sure the listeners will agree you've shared some fantastic nuggets, the gold really, some of those bits of advice for people. And I'm so looking forward to the next episode of Demystifying Mental Toughness, where again I interview another leading expert in their field. I'd like to give a big thanks to today's sponsors. Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosford, near Newcastle upon Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. Thank you for listening to Demystifying Mental Toughness today. To sign up for tips and advice to help you be the best that you can be, go to wwwsport excellence.co.uk and sign up to the Mental Edge newsletter.